So what do we mean by neuroscience data? Uh, if you understand for the past few years, the meaning and nature of neuroscience data has been changing. Uh, there is an increase in uh, movement from the raw measurements in neuroscience data to uh, inclusion of uh, models, the inclusion of uh, metadata, inclusion of or software as neuroscience data defined together as neuroscience data. And neuroscience data is generated from organisms. Uh, yeah. Oh, is that? That's better. So neuroscience data is generated from multiple organisms, uh, from multiple jurisdictions, and multidimensional data sets that we have in neuroscience. And because of the differences in regulations, the differences in uh, cultural acceptability of what should be generated and what shouldn't be generated, there are diverse uh, mechanisms of governing neuroscience data. Uh, the way neuroscience data is generated in Europe might be different from the way it's generated in Asia, might be different from the way it's generated in uh, Africa, for instance. So there's an increasing need, but uh, as we generate these data sets from different directions, from different uh, jurisdictions, uh, and also from different labs with different modalities, there's an increasing need for us to share data sets. So if I, don't understand the modalities that you're working with. How can we share data sets? If I don't know what to comply with in terms of data generation and data application, how can we share data sets? So there's an increasing need to share this data set book because uh, sometimes it's funder's requirement. If a funder funds your research, they require you to share the data sets. I'll make it open because there's an increasing need for open science and open data sharing. Also, uh, it reduces the cost of research uh, if we share data sets. So if I am going to, if I want to generate data set for a particular research question, and somebody else has already generated the same data set from another region to be good for me, if I can have access to that data set without spending any time. So data sharing is important because it reduces uh, the cost of research. And also for reproducibility. If you want to uh, engage in research that is reproducible, might be useful to have your data sets open for people to also try uh, to use your, your, your data sets for to answer the same research question. And also increase, it might be practical, a practical reason to share data set because it might increase our, our, our citation. Uh, so and some people do it because it is something that is right. So in all these, there are barriers to data sharing. Although there is an increasing need to share these data sets, there are barriers to data sharing. So there are legal requirements. Uh, have we heard of something called the GDPR? Who has heard about the GDPR? Good. So these are people who are maybe familiar with the European legal ecosystem. Uh, so there are legal requirements uh, for generation, for application and sharing of data sets. And these legal requirements can be barriers sometimes to data sharing. So many research projects, so many collaborations have collapsed in recent years because of legal requirements uh, for data. And then there are also ethical concerns uh, regarding data uh, that might be a barrier to sharing. Uh, there are organizational barriers. Uh, in Europe, where I'm from, uh, a lot of institutions are stopping data sharing simply because of the provisions of the GDPR. For me, wrongly, but they do it. So there are organizational barriers to data sharing. There are technical requirements that we need to understand before we share our data sets. And uh, we'll talk about all that. And there are also wider social cultural concerns that we need to be aware of that can also be form barriers to data sharing. So, and this is where data governance comes in. Uh, data governance 
uh, can help us to uh, mitigate some of these uh, uh, challenges, some of the barriers that we've mentioned now. Um, if you look at this uh, figure here, which was a figure we used in a, a paper we produced through the IBI work that we're doing, uh, in A, you can see as an individual researcher, there are so many requirements, there are so many uh, obstacles uh, th that you have to look at before you share data. There are journal requirements, there are uh, archives and processing platforms requirements, projects have their own uh, internal project uh, or restrictions for sharing, uh, there are funders policies that you have to look at, institutional uh, policies that you have to look at, uh, there are national laws, and as well as international treaties that you need to consider. So as neuroscientists, as scientists, you will think that's not what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to be thinking about the laws. You're not supposed to be thinking about ethics. You just want to get on with the business of science. But that's the reality that we find ourselves in. So that's what a single individual researcher will have to look at. But what we want is a figure on, in the B where we already know what we need to do. We need, we already have at least the knowledge of the ethical considerations, the legal considerations. Is there a way of harmonizing all these? Because the way it is at the moment is very diverse, very complicated, uh, and very, for me, not clear for researchers, individual researchers to understand what they need to do. But we want a harmonized ecosystem where we are aware of what we're supposed to do and we get on with the business of science. And that's what we want. And that's what data governance can give us. So what is data governance? Uh, you might be asking. Uh, Fortigil, one of my colleagues uh, uh, and a few other people produced the paper in 2019 and they defined data governance as the overall management of the availability, the usability, the integrity, quality, and security of data in order to ensure that the potential of the data is maximized while regulatory and ethical compliance is achieved within a specific organizational context. So all the policies, all the principles, all the procedures, all the frameworks that can ensure the availability, the usability, and security of the data, that is what data governance is. So, and that's what we expanded in our paper that appeared in Neuron in 2022, as what data governance is. So all the policies you put in place, all the procedures, all the frameworks that you set up, um, and all the principles that you identify and establish for your data pipelines, to ensure the usability, the availability, the integrity, and the security of the data. That's what data governance is about. But sometimes people misunderstand it. But what I tell people that the fundamentally data governance is about the people, the people in the data pipeline, the processes that you set up, and also the technologies that you establish to make sure that there's a functional data ecosystem that not only is functional for your research, but also complies with the law and ethics. And that's where ethics and the law come in. So sometimes people think data governance is just about data protection. It's just about data protection regulations. No, it's not just about data management because people mistake it for just data management. It's not. Although data protection and data management are part of data governance framework that you need to set up for your organization or for your pipeline, the data governance is not just data protection. It's not just data management. And it's not just a Gautier process. So scientists these days think that the GDPR or any data protection regulation, or whenever you talk about data governance, you want to get them. You want to catch them doing something wrong. No, it actually facilitates the work that you need to do. And as I said, data governance is about the people, the processes that you set up, and the technologies that you establish in your data pipeline to make sure that there's an availability of data sets, 
the data set is usable and then it's secure. So that means data governance facilitates FAIR. And I know we are very familiar with FAIR, especially the technical elements of FAIR. Our FAIR means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data sets. Uh, Wilkinson 2016, uh, that's where maybe, I know maybe, is there anybody that is not familiar with FAIR? Let me not presume. Yeah, that's okay, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2016, Wilkinson et al., large consortium of uh, individuals uh, produced the paper to emphasize the need for FAIR in science. Findable data to making your, your data sets findable, making them accessible because you can find data sets or you can't assess them. Because there are repositories that you can go to now, you can find the data, the data is there, but you can't assess it. So make it findable, make it accessible, make it interoperable, interoperable uh, so that it, you can use it with different technologies and also reusable. And this is the core of the advancement of science and technology, making data sets available, making data sets accessible, and making data sets interoperable and reusable. So data governance helps to facilitate FAIR. But when you add, as it is at the moment, it, if, if you have been thought about FAIR, you'll be talking about structures, metadata standards, and, and things, beads, uh, and I know maybe uh, before the end of the program, you will hear about beats or you already know about beats. The technical elements of FAIR are the things that are often emphasized, but that the, those are not the only elements that prevent data sharing, that prevent findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. There are also ethical and legal issues that prevent findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And when you ad identify and address these ethical and legal issues, it becomes fair C, compliance, which is an element that is almost missing in the discussions on fair at the moment. So compliance with ethical principles, compliance with technical requirements, compliance with legal provisions, and also compliance with societal expectations. And these are the things I want to talk about, but mostly the ethical principles and the legal provisions. So the technical requirements are very standard technical stuff that maybe most of you are already aware of, metadata standards. I mentioned beads earlier. There's also op open minds developed by uh, HBP. Uh, storage infrastructure. Uh, also cyber security. So these are technical requirements that can facilitate fair. And the same paper, Fortigulator, which I, I cited earlier, uh, produced this beautiful diagram that identifies some of the ethical issues in the neuroscience data life cycle from data collection, data processing, data curation, data sharing, data application, and data deletion. These are different stages of the data life cycle that raise different ethical issues. But we're not going to discuss all of them. Uh, one of the most important ones uh, is incidental findings. Uh, are you aware of what it means, incidental findings? Uh, for instance, you're working with uh, neuroimaging data. Um, you have scanned these people and upon analysis, you identify something that you never thought you could identify, maybe a disease that, uh, that wasn't what you were looking for. Uh, so what do you do? It's an incidental finding. So what do you do with it? So there are different protocols that you have to set up to address this. And these are based on regulations or laws in your region. In some countries in Europe, you have to set up a protocol for the participants to either agree for you to disclose incidental findings to them, or they can say, no, I don't want to 
hear it. Whatever you find, I don't want to hear it. But they have to give you their opinion, their consent to do this. So an incidental findings is not something often that you find in informed consent protocol. But because of the level of technological advancement that we have now that can make it easier for you to identify some of these uh, issues, you have to put it in the informed consent protocol. So there are so many ethical issues from data collection to data deletion. Uh, another one, uh, which they also, uh, this paper also identified is animal welfare differences. Uh, somebody will ask why animal welfare different? Why this here? I'll give you an example. This paper was, came out in 2019 um, from a group of Chinese researchers. Um, I think two or three US researchers produced this. And they came up with the idea, uh, they developed or they created a transgenic monkey carrying human gene. And they created this transgenic monkey with a human gene, uh, MCPH1. And just to study human development, right? To study how do we, okay, to study human development. And then when this paper came out, there were loads of headlines. There were loads of headlines. A lot of researchers were up in arms and said, what's happening? Um, as you can see, MIT, uh, or technology review, Chinese scientists have put human brain genes in monkeys, and yes, they may be smarter. Although these headlines might be sensational, but there is an element of concern when you, you hear this. And at the end, maybe after a month of bad press, one of the researchers, US re researcher who was part of this group, disassociated himself from the research because citing some ethical issues, complex ethical issues. So the question here is this, regulatory differences. In Europe, I, I've spoken with a, a group of researchers in Europe and they feel this particular experiment will not have been allowed to happen in Europe. I don't know the US, I've not spoken to any researcher in the US about it, but in Europe, it will not have been allowed to take place in Europe. But the question is, the data generated from this, from this research, if they deposit that data somewhere else, can an European researcher ethically use that data? Although this experiment will not have been allowed legally to happen in Europe. Can a researcher from such a region use the data? This is similar to the arguments that we have about the Nazi data, isn't it? Uh, the experiment is legally not allowed in my region, but if the data comes out, can I use it? If I use it, am I not implicitly endorsing the research? That's an ethical question. At the moment, there's no legal provision to address this. But at the moment, it's an ethical question. It's an ethical question researchers are asking themselves. And this can prevent data sharing. It's an ethical question because of the differences in regulation that can prevent ethical data sharing. And this is not a knock on any culture that allows this experiment because it's about cultural acceptability of what should be done to animals, right? Uh, because there are some experiments that you conduct in Europe and animal rights groups, groups will definitely be on your door the following day. But in so many regions of the world, you can definitely do those. But if we ethic objectively say, say to ourselves, we can use these data sets if they, if they come up. That means 
what we the ultimate goal will be ethics dumping. So whatever research that is not allowed in my region, I can outsource it to another region for somebody to do it and then give me the data. And that is what we call ethics dumping. So ethics, as I said, can definitely prevent data sharing. And there are also legal concerns that can prevent data sharing. Oh, privacy and data protection. Yeah, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. How is that different than what people are doing with like labor? Like there are labor regulations in the US, and like, well, it's cheaper and less sure elsewhere will do that. Um, we're okay with that. So it's um, how do you get that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, line of when we choose and take it through and abide by. Right? As, as somebody, maybe I think that was what the person was saying. There is no legal uh, provision to stop that at the moment, but some people are making ethical choices, right? So, so companies that do that, people consciously avoid buying goods from them. So it's an ethical call for yourself at the moment. And that's the same way in research, but there, there's no legal provision that addresses this at the moment. But so many people are talking about it. In neuroscience, people are talking about it. Uh, a paper uh, produced from the uh, Ethics Working Group um, of the IBI in, in 2018, um, uh, I think the lead author was Romo, Karen Romofonda. They also asked the same question. So people are thinking about it in neuroscience and it's preventing data sharing. So, there are also legal issues that prevent data sharing, privacy and data protection. And that's where the GDPR comes in. Always the elephant in the room, the GDPR. Um, informed consent. Uh, there are loads, in my interaction with neuroscientists uh, in the last three, four years, there are loads of data sets in silos at the moment that are not being shared simply because there's no adequate informed consent to share the data. And I will explain this later on. Uh, and this is not to say, because there's a difference between informed consent for the research protocol and informed consent for data sharing. These are two different things. Um, and then data ownership. This, that's another one that also can, that can prevent data sharing. Uh, I, I, was just, I was in Africa a month ago uh, at SONA, SONA conference. And there's a lot of discussion on data ownership because there is a fear for data colonialism. So they want to own their data. And there are regulations on this, uh, called data localization regulations on this to prevent data share so that people run away from data colonization. And that is something that can prevent data sharing. Um, and also this, that's something, this is something I wanted, wanted to mention because in, in research, Oftentimes, we think that we own data that we don't own, actually. If you call 300 people and scan them and get their data, do you think you own the data? Do you think you own the data? No, you don't. It is personal information. It is personal data. And the data subjects, own the data. Although you can control the data, you don't own it. They can come tomorrow and say, where's my data? I want to destroy it. That's it. You don't own the data. So there's a thin line between what you can own in data sets and what you can in science. But if you create a model out of the data, model, then that's yours. So some people put, um, licenses and uh, copyright on personal data of data subjects, and that's not right. Uh, so data control is another thing. The GDPR tried to address this through uh, the provision of data controllership and also international transfers. There are different regulations on international transfers of data. Uh, you can find out that within your country, your own country, it's easier to share data within the country, but when you want to share out of your own country 
or out of your jurisdiction, it becomes a big problem. So there are different regulations on different provisions that you have to uh, identify and address. And also regulatory differences, as I mentioned earlier, um, the ecosystem of data protection regulation is definitely emerging everywhere in the world. And that's something that we have to take, take into consideration when we uh, share data, when we are going into collaborations with people from outside of our, our labs, outside of our, our regions and outside of our countries. So how do we, the first thing is, how do we address some of these ethical concerns? I'm going to provide these insights from the GDPR, because as I said earlier, it's always the elephant in the room. And I found out that if you adhere to some of the provisions of the GDPR, you're almost adhering to the provisions of your own laws. Because people think I don't. People think the GDPR is more strict uh, than any other data protection regulation. Uh, so let's have this discussion through the G GDPR. So GDPR provided at least three approaches of addressing some of these ethical concerns in research. The first one is to identify a legal basis for processing always. You have to identify a legal basis for processing your data. The second one is to develop technical and organizational measures to safeguard the data, to prevent data breaches, to protect the privacy and confidentiality of the data subject. Uh, the first one, data protection impact assessment. This is a well-defined process for you to identify uh, some of the ethical or issues and mostly some of the legal issues that might occur in the data pipeline. And also identify possible liabilities and responsibilities within that pipeline. So if there's any breach, if there's any problem, there's somebody uh, that can be held liable or accountable. So, and that's what the data protection impact assessment does. And these are, as I said, there's a template for this, uh, that, that you can find online uh, from different countries in, 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 in Europe because different data protection supervisory authorities have their own templates and, and you can definitely find this. And then the second one, the technical and organizational measures, anonymization or pseudonymization. Anonymize, by anonymization, I, I mean the removal of both direct and indirect identifiers within the data sets. So both direct and indirect must be removed. And that's what is anonymization. It's irreversible. If you get to the point of irreversibility, then that's when you think you, it's anonymized. Can we get there? I don't know. The GDPR has this re-identifiability assessment uh, based on time, based on cost, and based on technical uh, availability, availability of technology to do it. How much time does it, will it take somebody to re-identify the patient? How much will it cost? If it costs like 10 million, 5 million, now who would do that? Just to re-identify one individual. Is there technology available to do that? If the answer to any of this is yes, then definitely you have not anonymized the data. But can we fully anonymize data sets in neuroscience? That's a question that we need to answer. But somebody want to have a question? Yeah? Yeah, I read a question about how uh, you are saying about costs and time, because this is something that is not static, but depending on the development of technology it can change. So is there like a cycle where they reassess what is considered to be anonymous, like at what point is the data anonymous and when is it not? That, that's a very good question. And that was what I was saying earlier. Can we actually uh, fully anonymize data sets in neuroscience, in research, actually? Um, I don't know. But if it would take two years or a year to re-identify a data subject, that's a long time. 
if it will cost, just as I mentioned earlier, like 10 million to do it, that's a lot of money. Who would want to do that? Is there technology available? I'll give you an example, which uh, one is neuroimages, right? MRI. A few years ago, if you deface an MRI, it's fully anonymized. If you deface it, it's fully anonymized. And the reason why researchers and scientists move to anon anonymization or declare their data sets anonymous is because once it is anonymized, it does not have to comply with the provisions of the law. It does not have to comply with the provisions of the GDPR or any law at all, right? Because it's anonymous, it's statistic, anonymous statistics, and that's it. And that's why sometimes, as I tell people, sometimes we're very quick to say, my data is anonymized, right? But with advancement of technology, even with defacing, there's also a possibility of re-identifying the patients at the moment. Years ago, that was impossible, but because of advancement in technology, we can now do it. So the third question of availability of technology is yes. Is there availability of technology to re-identify the, the, the data subject? Yes. So in neuroimages, I will say, it's be difficult for somebody to declare full anony anonymization for neural images. And that's where pseudonymization comes in. So have you removed the direct identifiers? Yes, if you have, that means it's pseudonymous. There are still indirect identifiers within the data set. For neural images, there are still brain prints that are like fingerprints or maybe stronger than fingerprints within the data set. So these are indirect identifiers. And that's why it is pseudonymized rather than anonymized. Somebody wanted to ask a question? Oh, I, I was going to ask, uh, would it depend on the advances of technology that for instance, right now for neuroimaging, it's very difficult to do the anonymization of the data set. Right? Mm -hmm. Because you can run, uh, run it through uh, ancestry.com or whatever, find the closest relatives of the last name and where was the study run? And you can pretty much narrow it down. Exactly, exactly my point. It's a moving target, right? It's yeah. almost a moving target. Um, what is fully anonymized today might not be fully anonymized tomorrow, simply because of advancements in technology. Uh, and that can definitely prevent um, data sharing. And then encryption. The GDPR has a provision for encrypt encrypting your data on transit or at rest. If you do that, then you have made a conscious effort to safeguard the privacy and confidentiality of the data subject. So in cases of breach, if your liability will have been like this, it reduces. So sometimes in science also, it's difficult to convince us to uh, encrypt our data sets, but there is a legal benefit uh, to doing that, uh, according to the GDPR. And then identifying relevant agreements that you need to put up as organizational measures. Data use agreements, data transfer agreements, data processing agreements, joint data controllership. And these are ag agreements you can get templates from data protect protection officers around the world that can give you. So you have to not only identify the legal basis for processing, you have to develop technical and organizational measures. And one of those organizational measures will be setting up agreements between yourself and the user or yourself and the person receiving the data or transferring the data to you. So these are organizational measures to protect you. So I've been talking about all this without defining what I mean by personal data or processing. So the GDPR applies to personal data, processing of personal data. And by personal, by processing any operation, any operation at all, or, or a set of operations which are performed on personal data. And by personal data, it's information relating, relating to an identified or identifiable person, a living person. So the GDPR does not apply to 
people who are there. It applies to living beings, identifiable living beings. Uh, and it applies to processing of that data, any operations, storing the data, collecting the data, sharing the data, any operation at all within the data pipeline is processing. And um, identifiable is if anyone can identify a natural person using means, all means likely reasonable or reasonably likely to be used, then the info, and reasonably likely to be used was exactly what I was talking about earlier on. Time, cost, and technology. So, and by personal data, names, telephone numbers, when you do your research, you can collect names or phone numbers or emails. These are all personal data. Or, or ID, or social security number, or, HR, human resource data, location data, IP. These are all general personal data. But in research, there's a special category that the GDPR defines. The special category data are data sets revealing the racial or ethnic origin of any individual. That's very special. Uh, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, genetic data, but the most important one is data concerning health. And that's what we usually work with, health data. The reason why the GDPR gave it a special category of studies in the, in the law is because they require special protection. All these data sets that are called special category personal data require special protection, like the health data that we work with. So, as I said earlier, personal data not only includes the raw data, but also the pseudonymized data. If you remove the direct identifiers and the indirect identifiers is still there, it's still personal data. That means it has to still comply with the law. And that's why, as I said earlier, researchers move away from pseudonym. In the US, the word is de-identification. Sometimes I've interacted with the US researchers on this. Sometimes the field de-identification is anonymization. No, de-identification, even as it is defined in HIPAA, is pseudonymization. Because there are still possibility of re-identifying the person because you still have the key somewhere to re-identify. So it's pseudonymization, yeah? <laughs> Sorry? If you anonymize the data mm -hmm. and it no longer, like the, the laws, like theoretically no longer to it, does the person still own that data or is one of the anonymized, we don't, you know, we don't. It's anonymized statistics. It, it has now become anonymous statistics, right? The person can claim ownership because the person can be re recognized. So what about the nuance of like maybe today people say that facing images is fine, when in reality, we know that even today you probably can identify something's brain. So like, do you think that, this, yeah. this is real life events happening, right? In some repositories that I work with, oh uh, yeah, the data has been defaced and fully anonymized, no longer applies to the, the but now you identify it's not anonymous, it's pseudonymized. That means every right the data subject had before you felt it was anonymized comes back. Exactly, because it's now taken as personal data. And now you begin to respect the law, comply with the law. Yeah. I have a question for that. Like personal data is different than living. So if you consider like high risk clinical health populations, person no longer living, that means the concordance risk is not as protected and it's excluded from this law. As a say pharmaceutical company, why can I not use their data to use family history to go back to indicate like who should I target for things? Because this person has a problem, then a higher chance their family may have it. So I can kind of work back down that a tree or off the tree. So if I understand you correctly, um this person is dead, but you want to maybe go to trace the family history, right? If you do not have consent for that, you can do it. It's just simple. 
If you do not have consent for that, you can do it. I, I have a case which I might not discuss here where family, one family is suing um, the lab for that at the moment. So if you do not have consent for that, you don't do it because you don't know how the family will feel about it because you don't have consent for that. Yeah, somebody had a question, William. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to touch on this film, um, but I'm going back to the I think that if at one point was considered anonymous, it's not because of taking a lot of people to think so, then doesn't that also conflict with our idea of data sharing? Because if we have a problem data set where we think it's anonymous, um, what time we have to not be anonymous anymore? Different laws come into play. Um, so, how is that going to get This is a very good question, actually. Um, I will answer this with the experience that we had in the HPP. The HPP is the EU Human Brain Project, um, just like the US Brain Initiative here in the US. Uh, so I'm the data governance coordinator for the, for the HPP. Before I joined the HPP, um, that was before the advent of the technology to re-identify uh, data subjects from neuroimages. It was very open. Uh, the platform that we have now called eBrains was very open, right, to anybody because the data, the neural images there were, but were defaced. So that was fine, very open. And then it hit us. There's technology available to re identify data subjects. What do we do? We shut down. We shut down for like a month to discuss with the DPOs, data protection officers, to discuss with the European Commission on what to do until we developed a pathway, a mechanism of protecting the data sets. We set up our organizational safeguards before we opened up again. So it happens, it can happen. But as I said, it's always a moving target because of technology. So, Personal data includes pseudonymized data or de-identified data, but excludes anonymous data, anonymized data, post-mortem data, or animal data. So if you're working on animal data, if you're working on post-mortem data or anonymized data, uh, it can be called personal data. So what I was talking about legal basis for processing earlier on. The GDPR in Article 6 provided three legal basis for processing, and you can identify if you're processing general personal data. Consent, clear consent for a clear purpose, or uh, contract, if you if it is an, if necessary for a contract, yeah. Legal obligation, or uh, vital interest, public tax and legitimate interest. But one I want to mention here is consent. Because when we talk about consent in our data processing, people think it's the same consent within the research protocol. No, it's not. Although that one is mandatory, right? It's mandatory, you have to get consent from the data subjects uh, because of the law. But also, if you want to use consent as a legal basis for processing your data, you have to get clear consent from the research subject. That this data will be used for, for this and for this and for this. Do I have your consent? to use that data? Yes. Which is not often the way informed consent goes, right? The traditional informed consent protocol goes. But for the basis of legal processing of the data, if you want to use consent, please, you have to get clear consent from the data subjects. If you don't, you can't identify consent as a legal basis for processing the data. But I will come back to this because as you can see, consent is not the only legal basis for processing in Article 6. But if you're processing health data or a special category data, you not only have to identify legal basis from Article 6, you have to also identify legal basis from Article 9. So two, one from six and one from nine. Explicit consent again comes here in Article 9, employment, vital interest, but most important one here, if you look at the last one, archiving purposes in public interest, scientific 
for historical research purposes or statistical purposes. Sometimes I have had this encounter with a lot of researchers. They feel consent is the only legal basis for processing that you can identify. No, there are other legal bases that you can identify. In Article 6, in Europe, many institutions are doing this now. They're very, being very intentional about it and putting it in their uh, research uh, policies now. For researchers to use public task as a legal basis for processing from Article 6, public task necessary to perform a task in public interest or an official function, but is necessary in the law. The work you do in science is in the public interest. So many institutions in Europe are making it very clear in their research policies now. You have to identify public tasks. And there's also another reason why consent is not the, the right legal basis for processing. I'll come back to that. And then in Article 9, archiving purposes and research purposes is clearly stated there. And in addition to this, there's a derogation of Article 89 that you'll have to also identify. So a consent is not the only legal basis that you can identify. So sometimes when people think, I don't have consent to do this, I'm not gonna share, I'm not gonna process this data. That's not true. There are other legal bases that you can identify for processing. So one lawful basis if it's required from Article 6, if you're processing, um, general personal data. For special category data, you have to identify one for Article 6 or one for Article 9. Those are the most important things there. This is very important. The data subjects have rights. They have rights provided by the law. So that person that has dementia that you're scanning has rights. The right to be informed always applies, always applies. It can come back. If last year, one of our collaborators or partners in, in France, they came back and said, they've had five emails from the patients demanding for information from them. And it was very unusual for them. This can happen. What do we do? And then we had to look, look into it and identify a pathway to give them information. So the, the right to inform always applies. The right to have access to the data always applies. In as much as it's still personal data. If you anonymize it, they lose those rights. So the right to rectification, to correct the information that you have always applies. The right to erasure, you can see there, it doesn't always apply. It doesn't always apply that the data subject can call you and say, Delete what you have about me in research. Okay, in research. Now I'm going to discuss it in research. The right to restrict processing doesn't always apply. The right to data portability doesn't always apply. The right to object to processing doesn't always apply. And the right in relation to automated decision doesn't always apply. And that's, this is why consent is not the, the right lawful basis for processing. If you look at this table, if you identify consent as a lawful basis for processing, the data subject will have a right to erasure and they will have a right to portability. Imagine you have data set from 500 patients and one, and you have put them in a pool and one person is asking you to delete the data that can change the course of your research. But it doesn't always apply. If, if you use consent as a lawful basis, it applies and you have to delete it. But if you use public task, it doesn't apply. And then uh, the same with legal obligations. Uh, public task, as you, as you can see, Right to erasure doesn't apply. Right to portability doesn't apply. And that's why research institutions are, are identifying, intentionally identifying public tasks as the right basis, right lawful basis for processing. 
So apart from identifying legal basis for processing, you have to create organizational measures. Um, relevant agreements, as I mentioned earlier, data use agreements, data transfer agreements, data processing agreements, and joint data controllership. Controllership is when you control the purposes and means of processing. If you control the purposes and means of processing the data, you're the data controller. You're not the owner of the data, but you're the data controller. Two or three people can have this responsibility. And if there are two or three within the data pipeline, then it's joint controllership. The reason why this is important is because if, in cases of breach, the data controller is the one liable. And this is important in research. So having joint controllership agreements is important in collaborations. So, and then finally, establish technical measures. Either you anonymize or pseudonymize. My advice always is don't be too hasty in making the decision that my data is anonymized. It can be pseudonymized. If you pseudonymize your data, you have taken the first step in protecting the privacy and confidentiality of the data subject. And that's fine. You can then try to establish all the organizational measures and encrypt your data. Just obey the law, comply with the regulations, and that's it. Rather than saying, my data is fully anonymized, and then all of a sudden there's a breach, you can't defend yourself at that point. So key points to note here is that the GDPR or any data protection regulation is not an excuse not to share your data. It's not. Rather, there are provisions within the GDPR and regulations that you can, that can help you to effectively share your data. Our consent for the research protocol is different from consent as a lawful basis for processing. This is important. So when you are establishing your informed consent protocol for your research, please put in there something related to data, processing the data so that you can get consent. Uh, in this case, I don't want to go into the details about broad consent and specific consent, which is a big issue in research. Um, uh, there are a lot of consor con consortia in neuroscience are actually dealing with, but uh, maybe discussion for another day. And consent is not the only lawful basis for processing, and usually not the best one. Uh, and always remember your duties to the data subject. There are right, the data subjects have rights, and you have obligations to them. So in summary, when you are processing personal data, especially health data, please try to identify a lawful basis for your processing, or create organizational safeguards, or establish technical measures, uh, so that in cases of breach, a liability uh, is a bit, limited and also you are responsibly responsibly processing the data so this is where research infrastructure is coming because as a single individual researcher addressing some of these issues are too much to ask sometimes um and that's why I, I keep talking to research infrastructures, that they have a lot of work to do in this space. They have a lot of work to help individual researchers to comply with the law, to comply with ethical principles. At the moment, only a few data repositories are doing this. And that is why, that's where eBrains, I was mentioning eBrains earlier on, eBrains comes in. eBrains is a research infrastructure um, developed by the uh, HBP, the European uh, Human Brain Project. Uh, as a legacy of the project for 10 years, the project has run now and is coming to an end in September. So we're transitioning into eBrains, a research infrastructure uh, that offers a lot of services. Uh, there is a data and knowledge service uh, that 
where you can share your data, where you can also find data sets. There are over a thousand data sets available for animal, from uh, different or organisms, or uh, animal, homo sapiens. Uh, we also offer Atlas and service. Uh, uh, simulation services, there are lots of simulation services uh, that we offer. And also brain inspired technologies. Um, uh, I, I know maybe many of you know about spiking neural networks. Uh, so we have um, uh, Spinnaker uh, and other technologies available through uh, eBrains and also the medical data analytics. analytics um, for me, so so there are lots of services that you can assess uh, on eBrains. But the, the good thing about this research infrastructure is that it helps individual researchers to identify some of these ethical and legal issues and to address them in the in the data pipeline. But not only through research infrastructures, you can definitely uh, start identifying some of these within your labs within your research institutions. So um, as I said, eBrains offers an infrastructure that balances fair requirements with compliance to ethical and legal principles and provisions. Uh, you, you can also get a curation process that supports you with technical requirements, as well as with organizational safeguards, uh, consent and agreement templates. So that's about it. This figure, let me explain this. Uh, and this is what we do uh, with eBrains. Uh, I might not go into deeper details. I was talking about direct and indirect identifiers earlier on. So let's say with, with neuroimages, if you come with raw neuroimage, MRI, we will not accept it. It's too raw. You have to pseudonymize, deface, or cause score stripping or whatever you want to do with, on it. Uh, if everything is intact, too raw, too dangerous, we don't take it. Uh, but if you pseudonymize, we accept it, but we term it pseudonymized, not anonymized. So we set up a special pipeline for that, what, that we call human data gateway, where you have to log in, you have to log in, we have to know who you are, you have to sign all the agreements, uh, uh, and the space is, uh, uh, is encrypted. Uh, uh, but then, if there's a possibility that you have fully anonymized it, it goes freely without any restrictions, and people can access it. But that's basically what this uh, figure is about. So what I want us to do, just to to close is to have a quick discussion in groups, maybe three groups, just a quick one, quick discussion. I think uh, Noah has provided information on this somewhere that you have to look at. Yeah, so I just put it in uh, the uh, Slack channel, but also it's in the uh, governance folder in the curriculum. But anyway, yes, it's in the Slack channel. Just a quick one, three groups, if we can, have three, one group here, the other group at the back, and then another group there. Just gather together, 10 minutes discussion on, look at the case study um, and answer the question. After the 10 minutes discussion, we're gonna come back and maybe one person from each group will tell us what you discussed. And the question is, what are the technical, uh, ethical and legal requirements these researchers need to consider? Can we just a quick one, quick, quick, so that 10 minutes and then we can come back and talk. So, I don't know how you're going to put them in. There. What's it? I don't know how you're going to put them, send them all. Kind of. Okay. So people on Zoom, uh, I'm going to put you all in a breakout room so that we don't, uh, so that you can talk amongst yourselves. Um, it'll be just a second. Okay, 
say Zoom people, you should have breakout rooms open. Yeah, some people are just there. They're discussing it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, are we are we yeah. late? Oh no, it's fine. I mean, oh, okay. uh, they they've got break. break okay. Yeah. okay, so we'll just the next session is tutorial. So we'll start from there. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, ten minutes. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not that I it's not that I think it's not that it's Yes, I Yeah, I mean, I, I, 
Yeah, so I'll take it around to bring it around and think that way the people on Zoom will be able to hear you. Yeah, we'll that way. So we'll be back in about 20 seconds. Yeah, I'll take it around. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so what I want us to do now is to have one person from each group to tell us what you have discussed, what are the technical, ethical, and legal concerns that these researchers need to consider. Uh, who wants to go first? And we'll come back to the people online. Uh, the same, somebody, just one person. Just take a quick minute to tell us what are the ethical, legal, or technical concerns that they need to consider. Who wants to go first? This group? Anybody? Who wants to take the mic? I think this makes the same points. Um, so I don't think we like overanalyze the whole um, study, but my personal opinion is how do we anonymize data about sacrificing clients? Because we do need to know certain information in order to like study. So for example, if we study effects of language, we do need certain metadata to take into consideration such as handedness, sex, age. So if we can anonymize it, like how can we can, are we not losing this? Like, um, that's the question I have. But yeah, that's yeah. You, you have a question, or I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, I, I completely agree with you. Um, and this was the question that we, in a paper, we produced uh, I think two years ago. Uh, on the, was the one we produced on this? Because we use we lose the utility of the data if we fully own it. So how can we preserve the utility of the data while also complying with the law? And that's one of the reasons why data governance is important. Uh, the focus of these uh, technical measures is important. We don't always have to say we want to anonymize the data. We can make it as simple as still the law. These organizational measures 
you know, people can have access to it. And the utility of the data is also there. But I didn't want the question, I wanted an answer. <laughs> so maybe I uh, will go to the second room. <laughs> Say on the technical front, you discussed the prospect of um, encrypting the data and also limiting access to the data to a select group of people. Yes, uh, encryption is one of the technical uh, aspects of what they need to be content. Um, if they want to leave access to the data or to people within the consortium, uh, they need to encrypt it in order to give people. Other devices and also comply with the law, but encryption is not important. Um, they can, because they can't share their raw data, right? Um, so, so the minimization might also be something that you have to consider. For something, maybe I I pushed your mind away from it. Or also something that they have to consider is the metadata standard that they need to use. Even uh, something harmonized, something that everybody will have to understand uh, in such a way that the language of the modality of the data is to be easy to understand for everything. So, you know, yeah, that would be an elementary thing. Thank you. One of the things we talked about was if the data is being collected by groups all over the world but stored in the US and the EU, do the folks say in like Africa and China still have good access to that data? Um, make sure they don't get locked out of the data that they work hard to collect. That's an important one. Um, international transfer of data that's something they have to worry about because now it's not just one jurisdiction working on the data, but multiple jurisdictions. Although the, the data will be collected from all over the world, will be stored in the US and Europe. And how do they also avoid the documentation, thinking that they own the data now, and people in China and Africa who lose access and control of the data, that's also an important one. And the last one. Okay, um, yeah, uh, a lot of what we chatted about, I think, has been touched on um, already, but uh, one of the major kind of legal issues that we foresee coming up is the fact that all these different countries and these different uh, research groups would have different governing bodies associated with them. So. Um, how do you standardize what you're doing, your, your research kind of pipeline, while keeping in mind with whatever the U.S. governing body has to say and what the European and, and um, Chinese and African, you know, all these different groups um, have to say about uh, the legal ramifications of what they're doing. Uh, and something Ariel brought up as well is that even different institutions will have uh, certain sort of legal requirements for how they handle their data and they how, how they collect their data. And these types of things. So, kind of standardizing that across the entire project would be very, very difficult, probably. It would be very difficult. And that's a very nice one. And that's one of the critical right, concerns because these are people working from different jurisdictions with different regulations. How can they harmonize their data patterns or workflows to comply with all the regulations? Because this is not just complying with EU regulation. This is not just complying with the US regulation, but also complying with other regulations. How can Africa comply with their regulation while comparing their data to another country? So harmonizing and differences in regulation is one of the things a consortium will have to deal with. For. And that's always a very difficult discussion to have. So anybody from Online, do you want to add anything? Okay, I so think we go. go on then. We can hear um, you. 
I think this global consortium should sit down and plan before even the data collection happens, because in different like countries or continents, you can even collect the data differently. And then they need a set of rules that are international, um, internationally available. Because for instance, if you do non-human primate research in China, that's only legal in China, but you wanna transfer that to internationally, then um, you need to take in consideration these rules. So like different countries or like different continents can have different types of research, but once you want to extend them internationally, then they would need to um, follow these regulations. So I think the first step is even before bringing the research together. I agree. Um, consortium agreement is always important before uh, such a project uh, commences. Uh, I'm happy with all the answers. Uh, these are issues or questions and challenges that you will have to think about when you enter into international collaboration. For some, these are things that you have to think about when your lab is collaborating with another lab, or maybe your institution is collaborating with another institution. But all in all, there is a need for you to consider some of the ethical, legal issues, and not just the technical issues sometimes when you're processing the data. And I hope this lecture has got you thinking, and in the future, you can start thinking about issues, these issues and how to address them. And maybe from some of the insights I've provided today, you'll find the answer. Thank you very much.